I'm going to kind of bring us back on track with the musical video because there was a, a there, there was a sequence to that that I'd rather stick to. I did deviate rather in the first part of the commentary. So here's Isis in the company of Horus searching the missing part of her husband's body. Well, they've already managed to find quite a substantial uh, proportion of the severed, dismembered corpse, and she's laying right next to it in this boat. The shoulder, the arm that you're looking at, and the entire sort of red area that goes down to this deformed suggestion of a leg are all parts of her husband, but there's one bit missing. And that, of course, is the phallus. So if you don't know the story, please read up on the story and then perhaps listen to the first part of the commentary and you will, uh, you will be taken on a journey that I think you'll never have imagined possible. So no, what we no. see here is um, basically uh, the, the part that uh, Isis is looking for, the, the missing phallus of Osiris. And there it is, the scrotum, the whole thing. I mean, there it is. But it's, you know, disguised and so on and so forth. But you have the elements are all present. So, um, and this has symbolic associations with the Eye of Horus, with Harlequin. The whole impetus, really, of the Hermetic tradition was around this, this, this conversion of sexual energy, so so this is the kind of level that we're dealing with on a on a personal level, and this was at the time something which Picasso found enormously relevant to his life. So, so in the legend, after he's cut Osiris up into fourteen parts and distributed them right across. Egypt, he, he throws the phallus into the River Nile, where it's consumed by fish. And that's what we see here. Picasso's incorporated that very salient part of the story into the composition of Les, Les Demoiselles. And it operates on different levels in the correct orientation of the picture, it has another significance, which we'll come to shortly. Um, and it has uh, relevance to the superficial comp composition of these prostitutes in a Barcelona um, brothel. It's typical of Picasso's use of multiple um, levels of meaning and his symbolic use of imagery. Uh, that, uh, that that we would get this kind of poetic interconnectedness um, going on. So the fish was obviously significant. It was personal. Uh, I mentioned how it relates to his name and how it was a personal symbol for him. So we've got a sort of dualistic thing going on uh, all the time with Picasso. Uh, the, the dark and the light, the, 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 it, it's in a funny kind of a way within this tradition. It's the dark force that um, resolves the problem. The problem can only be created if everything else, the, the good aspects or the potentially good aspects in the story aren't in their correct um, level of balance if there's if 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 the if the good isn't operating on the right level then the bad comes in and it becomes a sort of uh, a, a corrector of the situation by creating chaos uh, and you know set sort of symbolized this uh, chaotic uh, aspect and you only get the rise 
of order out of chaos. So you have to have the one to have the other. So here we have this <clears throat> from a sexual kind of um, perspective. Uh, Picasso tormented perhaps by his uh, desire um, on this level um, and and this this whole thing in operation leading him to question the whole business and try and find a resolution for it so the problem creates the solution or uh, moves the whole thing in that direction so uh, out of chaos we get order so here we are now looking at the mummified Osiris and he's pointing to the sky this is very traditional even though it looks kind of crazy uh, it, it, remember we're in a cartoon epic Picasso's cartoon epic of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon and there are all kinds of things going on in this picture. So what we've got is the suggestion of bandages coming from around this kind of exposed head portion and the lower part of his body bandaged up and this deformed arm with, with suggestions of bandages, the, these straggling white areas. So we've got that. We've got the mouth in the correct position. This, I, I think, is probably meant to be one eye. And here, where the other eye should be. Now remember, Osiris was kind of symbolically blind. And this, this is that sort of erect phallus uh, shape, where the eye is. And the association between the two is desire, sexual desire, makes us blind. This is kind of what is being suggested here. And um, the demise of Osiris caused through this blindness. And in the legend, uh, there, are, there are various versions of that. But uh, in one, it, it is suggested that Set murdered Osiris because Osiris had had sexual relations with Nephthys, uh, the wife of Set. You see, so there's this kind of thing going on in the background of this legend. The image of um, the mummified Osiris pointing at the sky, but the sky is also his son Horus. Horus is symbolic of the sky. He, be he becomes the god of the sky. So the two can be equated. So he's pointing at his son was that this is the ascended Osiris. He's now up in the heavens. And um, he's there looking down, as it were. And uh, I'd like to draw your attention to this. If you look at my cursor, there's this spike, you know. Yeah, we talked about it in relation in an earlier talk to... Uh, the fish and personal symbolism. So here we have sort of the horned god Osiris. Uh, he was a horned god. He had uh, the horns of a bull. So th this was all very, very relevant to the Egyptians and to Picasso too, because it now draws in a lot of personal symbolism. These lines are all present in the composition of Les Demoiselles. So we have one horn here in the perfect location in relation to the head. We have another horn here. Again, all these lines are present. So at the top of the head here, suggested. And the reason why I pointed to this uh, spike is because it points here the snake that comes out of the third eye of Pharaoh. Picasso has incorporated this suggestion of a snake rising from the third eye of Osiris. So, uh, again, this has sexual connotations, things like uh, Kundalini and so on and so forth. One sees images of Toth, 
offering snakes wound around these sticks and he's offering them to the pharaoh the concept of some kind of uh, association between um, the kundalini spiritual uh, awakening thing and pharaoh is very very strongly suggested in some of the egyptian um, iconography involving Where toth we and see a detail of a painting known as la vie to the left of it is a study with the pointing finger which he subsequently changed and uh, supplanted the image of Cassigamus, uh, his friend who killed himself. Um, so Picasso's redeployed the idea of this painting and supplanted Cassigamus in place of himself. And it's obviously referential to um, pregnancy, giving birth, tragedy, misery, and being confronted with uh, the result of one's uh, sexual attraction, and so on and so forth. Now, in the study, we see much the same symbolism as depicted below, with Harlequin doing the um, as above, so below uh, gesture as above, so below, Hermes Trismegistus, Harlequin, the Emerald Tablet, this is where it appears. And Picasso's using that in the above study, the study which appears above in the upper left, and then sort of supplanting Casagamus and uh, we've got this finger now pointing at a baby okay. and we've lost the reference to the as above part of the box well um there's a lot that could be said here uh firstly we talked to quite quite some length about the occult origins of all this um, and in the lower right, we can see a painting of John the Baptist by Leonardo da Vinci uh, making the same gesture. He was, of course, part of this very same hermetic occult artistic tradition as Picasso, very much in a direct line of descendancy. Uh, Picasso. Uh, was was part of this hermetic tradition and uh, as I've said he was very traditional very very traditional on, in some ways so <clears throat> my theory uh, which may or may not be relevant to some people is that uh, Picasso felt awfully guilty uh, his friend had committed suicide in a public place in a, in a bar um, surrounded by his friends and uh, he shot himself in the head with a pistol and uh, Picasso's reaction to that was to paint a, quite a few images including a burial scene um, and it obviously had, uh, had, a, had, a, had a great significance to Picasso the loss of his friend and whether or not he had some involvement is hard to say. Uh, one would have to know more about the whole thing. But I think the suggestion is that, yes, he may have had some sexual liaison with Casagamus's lover, and that may have been the spark that ignited Casagamus's uh, reaction and led to his suicidal act in this cafe. I don't know, but I think there is some kind of reason to suspect this may be the case. And uh, why do I say that? Well, it's looking at us in the, right in the face here. He has supplanted the image of Casagamus where his own image should be. 
as if he is willing the return of Cassagamus. Cassagamus in this picture is dead. And so what we get is a very, very similar set of symbols to what I've been presenting to you in this sort of Egyptian layer of the Les Demoiselles layer cake, of the recycling of life. So Cassagamus has returned in the form of a child. Now, the question is, why is Picasso's uh, face in the studies and not Cassagamus's? And it's my suspicion that uh, there may have been a pregnancy involved and that Picasso was somehow in love he, to the best of his ability was trying to will the return of Cassagamus into this world. Now it's entirely a personal reading and it may have no relevance whatsoever to reality and the facts. But uh, after having looked at a great deal of Picasso's symbolism, uh, that is the feeling I'm left with. I'm left with the strong suspicion that, uh, that Cassagemus's lover may have become pregnant and Picasso could have been the father. And what we're looking at in La Vie is this uh, personal, very personal um, depiction of Cassagemus being willed back into the world as if Picasso is offering his child to Cassagemus. That's how I would tend to read this. And the tragic figures in the background mourning the sad loss of this tragic figure, this young man who took his life over, um, again, uh, sexual attraction. You know, uh, we uh, tend to convince ourselves it's a thing called love and uh, end up shooting ourselves in the head. It's a pretty good illustration of uh, our misconstruing uh, uh, sexual obsession and uh, attraction for love. Um, very easily done and we all fall victim to that at some point. So uh, coming back now to Leonardo and the, uh, uh, the hermetic tradition. Uh, we have the element of the cross and a lot of the people in the hermetic tradition in some of the great names in Western art were very much in these uh, in this hermetic tradition and also incorporated things in their pictures uh, to some extent. Picasso, very much part of this, associated himself with it very, very, very much and uh, knew that he was part of this part of this thing. So there we have this Osiris, Horus, recycling of life being presented to us. As above, so below. So, so we return. Now, there are many other ways of reading this symbol and the meanings of it. Um, but in reference to what we've been discussing, I would suggest we're looking at this recycling of life. You know, one dies and another returns. Back in Egypt, dealing with the nitty-gritty of this story, the whole thing kind of revolves around the concept of blindness. And in this case, it was Osiris who was blinded by the beauty of Nephthys, the sister of his wife. Nephthys was the wife of Set. And it led to this struggle. And what I'm proposing is that in this fruity area of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, we have the explicit details put before us. 
Um, so just to kind of lay the groundwork a little, Isis transformed herself into a bird. In some versions of the legends, it's a kite, and she fashions a replacement phallus, and she installs this on the reassembled, mummified body of her late husband, and magically impregnates herself with her son Horus. Nephthys and Isis were very, very close. They were all really brothers and sisters from the same family. So this is all an intra-familial situation. Nephthys helped to search for the missing body parts of Osiris. So what we get are these two figures with suggestions of wings, almost angelic. Uh, these arm positions are symbolic of wings. She's been searching for her husband's body parts and she is now um, lowering herself onto the replacement phallus in order to impregnate herself. Neptis too took this form. She has the vestige of a wing. She has one arm up, one down. So it's as if she's holding body parts in that one lowered hand. And then lower down on the table of fruit, we have a very reminiscent form in the area that I've indicated, the phallus of Osiris. This piece of melon now seems to transform itself into one of these axes which has a shaft in the middle and there are um, references to this type of weapon it's it's known that such weapons exist what it's doing that semi-circular blade is slicing off the head of the phallus of osiris and the little grapes have now become the sperm of osiris and one of the pieces of fruit, the one which isn't being cut off the phallus, is now the vagina of Neptis. So we've got this sort of association between the Eye of Horus, which was given as restorative food to Osiris to help him make his final journey to the stars. And the, the, the whole symbolic kind of suggestiveness is of this um, sexual uh, this sexual association between uh, the blindness of lust, you know, uh, the lust of Osiris for his wife's sister, leading to this tragic um, demise of the great first pharaoh of Egypt. Um, and uh, the restoration of his sight by being offered the eye of his son. So the whole thing kind of does a 360. The symbols go round in a circle. So this will be the final uh, part of this talk. There will be uh, supplementary material, supportive images and so on explanations uh, to follow and that will be the end of this whole Leda Moiselle um, introduction. Now um, what we're looking at is our little fruit table again and uh, I'd like you to imagine that you're looking at a face with uh, a mouth slightly downturned here two eyes, the head here, this is a cartoon head, okay, and I'd like you to imagine that this is a sort of kind of play on the harlequin hat, there's something along those lines, so we've got this kind of imaginary face, two eyes, with a nose incorporated, okay. Well, this was the very first image that made me aware of hidden imagery in Les Demoiselles. Because when I looked at it, I, I could see this cartoon character. The suggestiveness 
to me was uh, indicating that we've got fruit nailed to our eyes. We're not seeing what we're looking at. And uh, this, I think, was Picasso's little jest, his visual joke. And in this particular case, back in 1907, all the critics and all the other people in the art world who saw this picture, you know, what they were looking at were the human forms, this visual presentation of nude women. And that's what they were seeing. They weren't seeing what was in the picture. And nobody has really been looking at it.